Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, business breakfast, to this thinking with uh, Sharon White. Um, Sharon, I usually give an extremely baroque introduction to these things about how we are the only place in the media where you get to hear from the leaders of businesses and spend an hour listening properly to the choices they face and the, uh, the problems they're confronting. Actually, this hour, I'm just going to say, we offer possibly the only place in the media where for one hour today, we're going to discuss things that are mostly other than Meghan and Harry. So that's your, <laughs> this is the, this is the, this is the, this is the, this the, is the, the same space. The, 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 the relative <laughs> space. Something tells me that even with the best will in the world, sooner or later, um, Meghan and Harry will, uh, uh, will join us. I looked at the front pages of all the papers this morning and I and I sort of chortled at my old paper, the FT, where when everything else was, what have they done? Worst palace crisis for 85 years, et cetera, et cetera. The FT's was uh, something along the lines of Bailey worries about inflation in post-pandemic boom. <laughs> and I thought to myself, okay, we're doing something uh, not entirely or quite as arid, but we are going to try and do something that is focused on how the pandemic has hit, not just John Lewis, I hope, Sharon, but, you know, mm -hmm. but by extension, hit the high street, hit the consumer, hit the way in which we uh, live. Um, I won't... Uh, um, one of the things that we do in these thinking though, Sharon, just to let you know, is that we try to make sure that you hear from and get to talk to as many people, as many tortoise members as possible. So please do weigh in with your thoughts. If you've got thoughts, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll know some of Ka Sharon's life story uh, in the Treasury, in the World Bank, uh, leading Ofcom, now running John Lewis. There's a fair bit to talk about. Um, and Sharon, before we start, I, I, you know, I know that there's always a caricatured story of someone's life. There's always a kind of shorthand version of someone's life. But when you think about the fact that you're doing what you're now doing, what is it that you think from your childhood, from your education that set you up for it? That's a great question. Can I first of all say um, it's so nice to be here. I think this is the only time I've ever had a sort of hour particularly given the last year to sort of sit sit back and um and sort of and contemplate so this is it feels like a great privilege this morning and it's and James it's lovely to sort of reconnect um backstory I guess um I mean some of you on the call will know my my parents um were part of the Windrush uh generation my mum was 19 which I can't you know I look back and think oh my god my kids you know my, my older son's almost 19 was 19 when she came uh from Jamaica to uh the UK and my dad was in his 20s and in the early 60s, and they, and they both met in, in London, um, neither of whom really completed school. So my mum, uh, my mum basically did, did a bit of, sort of elementary school, basically left school at 11, um, and my dad around 14 and 15. So I guess that growing up, I was always, um, it's not that my parents are through education they're down my throat, but I was always really conscious that um, the very fact that I had, I was, uh, you know, I was able to go to school and able to complete my schooling until 18, um, you know, it was something neither of my parents had managed to do. And, um, and it's funny, James, when I look over my sort of career, and I never really think about it, it's been sort of terribly planned and it's always felt like I've sort of moved on, all oh, that looks fun and that looks sort of interesting. And it's always felt a bit sort of serendipitous. Um, but I guess to the degree to which there's a sort of common theme, I've always been interested interested in in work and progression um, for people who are probably furthest for the labour market. So although it may look really odd that you know I was a civil servant for eons, um, and then was a regulator for a chunk of, chunk of time, and now I'm on the partnership. I mean, the partnership was basically set up as a sort of mini welfare state. Mm. Like, by Speed and Lewis, um, you know, he's, he's written you know, books on this sort of experimenting um, industrial democracy um, as a sort of alternative to communism. So sort of set up as a as a sort of um, ent enterprise organization business where the whole point of the business is to make sufficient money uh, to give back to the people who work there so they can have good lives, um, uh, good pay and essentially a lifestyle that mimics that of at the times of professional classes 
Um, and I guess when I think about my parents, my mum's passed away now, my dad's uh, still alive. What really dominates, particularly for my mother, was work. Hmm. Yeah, they came here as immigrants for work and they had planned to stay five years and they stayed, you know, for the rest of their um, adult lives. My mum was the only, you know, when I was growing up, basically women didn't work. You know, the only women who worked were black women, women from the Caribbean, because, you know, they were working hard to send remittances back, um, you know, back to Jamaica. Uh, and she worked really hard. She was, you know, worked in a factory for, you know, for 40 years or so. So, you know, I probably haven't thought about it at the time, James, but I guess looking back, um, the sort of importance of work and of work being meaningful even you know my parents did kind of quite what would be regarded as quite some manual quite meaning menial work but that there's sort of you know there's um there's value in it mm -hmm. and also being very conscious obviously of the opportunities that you know i've had in spades um that they you know that they they you know as i say it was it was you know it was extraordinary that they even that they managed to leave Jamaica just to get work if they'd stayed in Jamaica they probably would have had you know very long periods of unemployment. And Sharon, what do you think? That's so, that's so interesting because I don't think I would have drawn that thread. You know, work and and progression in the labour market. Um, let's come to John Lewis in a moment. But you know, thinking back, you know, the the, the largest chunk of your career, I suppose, was at the Treasury, was engaged in the question of how would Britain make its way in the world? How would we make sure that we had a society that was as prosperous? How would we make sure that as many people as possible could, could come to work, could uh, make, you know, to use your phrase, progression through the labour market? How, what, what do you think of our modern effort on that front? When you hear all the talk about levelling up, when you see the evidence of, of inequality, you know, you know, by, you know that, that was so evident last year, What's your view of how Britain is doing on that front? Yeah, I mean, this is this is this is one of my um, my sort of pa my sort of personal passions and my work um, passions, as you say. I mean, I spent a lot a long time uh, advising on supporting sort of devising um, programs, particularly particularly different sort of employment programs. Um, that would try to support those who were sort of furthest from the labour market, um, whether that's women, women with kids, um, uh, people from particular disadvantaged backgrounds, um, you know, people in parts of the geography, you know, now with levelling up, who, you know, been hit hard hit by, you know, the ma manufacturing loss uh, sort of years and years ago. And I think, um, I think my my reflection is that it can be very easy to tell very sort of simplified stories about leveling up. Um, you know that it's. Uh, I mean, if I think even about the, you know the sort of diversity question, and and I spent a long time on you know so-called leveling up of, of 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 people from ethnic minority backgrounds. There is so much diversity. So you know, huge issues amongst um, you know families, particularly women from uh, Bangladeshi backgrounds. Um, you know, very, 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 very sort of dis big disconnects both from society and the economy. And at the other end, you know, you've got incredible education rates and incredible progression uh, of people from an, you know, an East, East Asian background. And I would say that um, the, I think that the government's focus on levelling up, I think, is to be applauded. I think, you know, taking a really sort of granular view of um, the families and the groups and the communities and the very sort of particular circumstances that are, you know, holding, holding people back. Some of those are societal, some of those are cultural, some of those are systemic in the way in which, um, you know, some, some of our public services are, uh, are designed. But I guess I would, you know, I would, I would sort of recommend taking a, you know, as sort of forensic um, a perspective as possible. And, you know, your point about the pandemic James, you know, lots of people are now talking about, worried about, you know, so-called K-shaped yeah. uh, you know, recoveries. Um, you know, the people like us, you know, very happily, you know, working from home pretty, pretty smoothly, um, you know, with very little disruption over the last year, you know, zooming up very quickly, lots of accumulated savings, 
um, you know, even not being able to take, you know, the holiday last summer. And, uh, and there's a degree to which it has exposed uh, people for whom the digital divide, poor housing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a great glass half full person and I hope the attention on uh, the impact of the pandemic and how it's affected different communities and the possible likely progression, you know, out of, you know, out of the pandemic and into sort of more normal life. I think, I think the debate, I think is, uh, is incredibly sort of positive and, um, you know, couldn't happen fast enough. And, and do you think, I see that John Alexander's made a point, and actually you hear this more and more, Sharon, I don't know what you see in the chat, is raising the point about universal basic income. And I think it, 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 let's face it, it had a following prior to the pandemic. The use of furlough has put it on the radar in a much wider context. And I think also there is exactly, as you say, this concern about K-shaped recovery, the people who do well do better and the people who do worse do even worse. Um, I'm, I'm just going to invite John in just to make the point about uh, if, if you're there and you can hear us, John. Do, do you want just do you want just raise the point about universal basic income? Is that hi, John? Yeah. Oh, hello, hi, Sharon. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's just a, it seems to be a very big debate at the moment. I'm, I'm involved in some of the campaigns here, uh, a game called the Basic Income Conversation, um, that, that are working across different political parties to kind of build the momentum. The Liberal Democrats and the Greens both have it as party policy. You've seen uh, sort of uh, in rising calls for trials in places like Hull, for example, where, where, you, where you thought actually the conditions to try something would be pretty good. Uh, and I'm just interested in your view, having worked in the Treasury for a long time, all you talked about about the importance of work and, and looking at the statistics just this week from Stockton, California, where yeah. Mike Tubbs is mayor and 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 the the, the sort of the, the the sort of the people furthest from the labour market do actually seem to have benefited significantly from it in Stockton and one or two other places. So I'd be, just be really interested in that in your view on it. Yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting question, and you'll know, John, that. Um the whole question about universal basic income sort of comes in fashion and waves. And I mean, I looked at this many, many years ago when I was at the Treasury and, it, and, it's, and it's fascinating because it's not necessarily party pre, um, you know, certainly the days when I was sort of going to conferences on this, you know, it, from people from Sam Britton, um, you know, James's former colleague, you know, right the way through to, you know, uh, more traditionally sort of left leaning sort of politicians and policy thinkers. Um, but you know, it was, a, it was an issue that, that gained lots of, um, I would say, sort of policy traction rather than practical traction. Although I think, uh, you know, the earned income tax credit, obviously Richard Nixon, uh, now you know, many decades decades ago, of which the sort of universal credit is almost a sort of you know grand grandson granddaughter of. So you've had aspects of it which have become, um, which have become sort of you know practical policy but not in its full 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 scheme I mean I've always been interested in this I mean the the, the the argument as you know has always been between the sort of you know the the right to um you know the right to benefit that's going to provide you with choice and um um you know you can you know and and whether you make a choice to work or whether you make a choice to give back to society in another way is is, is valuable versus you know boring boring issues for a treasury official which is you know cost and and work disincentives i think i think trialing this um uh and i think you know finding i think trialing this in the uk would be would be fascinating i think whether it's you know whether you take maybe a southern geography um northern geography i mean you look at some of the um you know the the inequality issues still in parts of London, um, different complexion, but you know as as sharp and difficult as some of the places in the north. I'm, I'd be fascinated um, because I think I think the you know whether you decide to invest in this or not is very much an a sort of an, an empirical um, question. You know, essentially depending on whether the sort of you know the the, the value that this gives to the individual um, and the the work ethic. Not necessarily, as I say, a paid work could be, you know, could be all manners of sort of socially useful work, versus the, you know, the kind of cost of the exchequer. Uh, I think it would be fascinating to test in, in real time. And you, so, Sharon, you wouldn't have a philosophical. Uh, sorry, John, did you want to say something? 
I don't have a philosophical objection if that's the question. On yeah, yeah, you don't have you don't have a philosophical no. objection either to the implications for the value of work or to the potential cost to the exchequer in the future. I don't because I think um, I think you know valuing payback to society. You know, it could be you know your you know this supports your you know cultural endeavours or supports your charitable work, but that's a Obviously, that's a societal question to answer, and then for taxpayers to decide whether that's how they want to to spend their money. But from a personal point of view, I, I don't have any philosophical objection. I'm, I'd be fascinated um, to see whether we could, you know, we could make this make this fly. Okay, that's fascinating, um, John. Thank you for the for, for that, um, and. Um... I'm sure there will be lots of people who I know are really interested in this subject. Will be very, very interested to hear that you think that. Sharon, let's let, let, let let's come on to a uh, another great social endeavour, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, John Lewis itself. I mean, you teed it up a little bit in terms of thinking about uh, an enterprise itself that wasn't driven for a expressly for a profit, but for a set of social outcomes. For, for, for those of us who, um, like everyone thinks that they know and understand John Lewis and have views about it, but, but can you just talk about when you first got that, had that first conversation, you were running Ofcom at the time, um, what did you think, and, and when you arrived at John Lewis, what was, the, what was the business or what was the culture that you thought you were stepping into? Uh, yeah, it's great questions. I, I mean, I remember getting the, I got a phone call from a headhunter because it's gosh, I can't believe it's a couple of years ago now. Um, they said, Oh, you know, we're we're sort of you know thinking about recruiting for um the chairman of the John Lewis partnership. And I was, you know, obviously I've been really intrigued and I'd done a bit of work when I was still at the Treasury on um, mutual models and you know applying the John Lewis partnership model to public services, particularly health. But I sort of thought they'd got the wrong CV uh, because, of, you know, obviously I'm, you know, I'm not a retailer, um, you know, not worked in business before. And, um, you know, I had a com conversation with the, with um, different people in the business probably about for about so three, four uh, months before, um, before I was appointed. And I have to say, uh, as, as the process ran on, um, I got more eager and more passionate about the business because, it's like I think it's the, the fascination of a commercial enterprise that is ultimately about doing social good. Um, it's a you know it's a I just you know in a you know post financial crisis now post pandemic. I mean it's a I think it's an extraordinary extraordinary set of principles. But I have to say I was you know I was also quite surprised that ultimately I thought gosh you know they'll you know they'll go for more seasoned seasoned retailers. So. I was really in, intrigued. I hadn't, you know, hadn't any plans to leave off common at the time. I think I'd done for sort of four and a half years or something. Um, uh, but it's a, it's a, I just think it's a, it's, it's fascinating that the UK in 2020 has a business of a 10 billion pound turnover, 80,000 partners, um, what we call our employees, that's got a constitution whose first principle is the happiness of partners through meaningful work in a commercially successful business. So the, so the philosophy I find, um, I, I mean, it's, just a, it, you know, it's the reason I jump out of bed um, uh, every morning I'm, I, and, 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 and helping hopefully sort of turn a business around to be more commercially successful so we can do more good. So that that's the reason why, why I took the call, I guess, James, and the I'm reason sure. The reason, sorry. No, no, can I, can I ask you about that? Because I think, and this isn't going to be no help to you, I think that if we were having this conversation three or four years ago, the, the sort of the drift of the conversation would be, why can't more businesses be more like John Lewis? Why can't there be more of that, as you say, that mutual model, that, that, that the idea of the partnership? In 2021, I think people look at John Lewis and think, oh my goodness, you're having, you know, the, an accelerated onslaught on yes. water, uh, retailing, possibly a fundamental change in the way in which consumers behave, and as a result, is partnership a uh, you know a, a luxury more than you can bear? In the sense that, can a partnership be agile enough? Can it restructure well enough when you're trying to take care of the interests of partners as well as the interests of customers, and then overall that 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 requirement to deliver to the you know, to the financial bottom line. 
Yeah, and it's the and it's the question people ask, and I and I always flip it. So I think that the secret to our success, and obviously, you know, you look at the last year, you've had a decade worth of change in retail in a you know in a year, and there was already a huge amount of transformation happening before the crisis. I think the partnership model is the is the key to our success if we can get it right, because it means you know I don't have shareholders in you know every quarterly results asking about my you know my cost cutting plan you are we are as a partnership able to think more long term uh, and to innovate more and you know if I look at some of the really big shifts in retail over the last 15 20 years um, online so you know John Lewis partnership were very very early into online at a point when everybody thought that we were slightly mad because we bought buy.com at the you know first dot com bust click and collect etc so I think the the, the the secret for us now succeeding and coming through the crisis stronger is actually to root ourselves more firmly in our principles rather than somehow you know sort of put our principles on one side because somehow it's too costly to do the right thing by our people and by our customers but we've got to adapt more quickly and we've got to adapt as fast as the market's moving and Actually, the last year has given me, um, you know, to be honest, an abundance of confidence. So, I mean, small examples, I look at Waitrose, and um, obviously we've had the sort of end of the Ocado relationship uh, during the course of the year. You know, Ocado has quadrupled, um, sorry, Waitrose.com has quadrupled over the last year with the fastest growing online uh, retailer uh, in the country. You know, John Lewis, um, you know, we when we've we've closed our stores three times over the course of the last year, and each time actually the strain has been taken by what's turned out to be an incredibly flexible, incredibly agile supply chain. So I'm not under, I'm not understating the challenge, James, but I think um, our partners will be more driven by us being a more purposeful business. I think customers are. Mm you know, desperately um, looking to shop with businesses that have, you know, stand for not just the bottom line. Mm. And we've got a heritage and a, an authenticity mm-hmm. and a brand and trust, um, you know, that other businesses would kill for. So there's lots to do, but I think we've got lots of very, very strong foundations. So, so, can you just tell us then what's the what's the plan, Sharon? When, what, what do you think is going to happen to department stores? What do you think is going to happen to supermarkets and grocers? And and how do you change to accommodate, as you say, you, you know, the acceleration and changes in in retailing and shopping in the last year? Yeah. So obviously, I mean, the the, the shift to online is not new. It's been massively um, accelerated, and and. Uh, I would say there's very much a blend between stores and online. So, um, you know, we're neither neither of our brands is ever going to be, a, you know, an, a, a fully digital business. It's not what our it's not what our customers want. So our customers still want, um, you know, fantastic stores. They want them to be more enticing. So if they're going to get off their sofa with their, you know, laptop to come into a shop, they want it to be. You know, big draw. They want it to be more local. They want it to be more convenient. So, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, more people don't shop with with John Lewis at the moment is actually, you know, is distance. So there's, I think, a lot of opportunity for us to become more convenient and more local. I think, you know, department stores have got to be, um, have got to offer more than as a transactional um, experience for people to be drawn into. So there's, you know, there's a lot of We've got a lot of really creative ideas and a lot of lot of um, I think lot, lots of lots of um, uh, uh, some new uh, uh, excitement coming up coming up for customers this year. I think value is going to be very important. So you know, just thinking about coming out of the pandemic, you know, this recession is likely to be very differently shaped um, from the slowdown after 2008. After 2008, basically most of us stayed in work, luckily, and the strain was taken by real wages. This time around, you know, sadly, there's likely to be, you know, more of a shakeout in, in, in the labour market. So we're definitely looking at how we can um, really offer more value, keeping the same quality, but more value. 
and really doubling down on um, on sustainability. Uh, and we're you know and we're moving quickly, and that means some um, inevitably it means some um, difficult decisions as you're adapting to how customers want to shop. And you know you'll know we we you know we very sadly closed um, some stalls last year, but we will be investing. And we will be investing to make sure that customers who want this blended experience of online and digital get quality, value, sustainability, easy, convenient shopping, um, you know, where, where, however they choose to shop. And, and Sharon, I think, so, so I think if you've read the coverage, or at least I, when I read the coverage, mm. I sort of, I can, I can just begin to make out the, the beginnings of a strategy, but if I'm honest, I can't really see it in the sense I can mm. see I think it was eight stores that were closed last year and in the announcement of you know quite a large number of people leaving the partnership you know the, and you can understand when you're faced with this sort of you know obvious kind of financial pressures that the mm -hmm. first step is okay make sure you've got a grip on your costs that you're not running businesses that are that, that are going to lose and lose money then the next step is though okay well how, where does that growth come from because i think it's it's one thing for you to say, actually, people are going to want to go to businesses that stand for something. People are want to go to businesses that have a set of values. I'm sure that's true, but it's probably not enough. And so I, I wonder how you think the department store reimagines itself. How does the high street reimagine itself? And what does John Lewis hope to do online that it hasn't done already? Yeah. So, I mean, maybe if I talk a little bit about sort of, you know, Gosh, you know, you've, there have been lots of sort of difficult decisions. What's what's the plan? Mm -hmm. So that I would call out sort of two two fundamental aspects for us. One is um, retail that customers love. So you know, um, you know, more enticing products and services. As I say, particularly focusing on quality, value, and sustainability that that calls particularly younger customers to give both brands a second look. And I can talk a bit more about that. And so partly that's the ease the ease of how we shop between stores and online, but it's actually really doubling down on wonderful products. And, and there's a lot of investment going in, particularly into home, which has been our big, you know, uh, big category in the past. And we've, we've slightly lost our way a little bit. Um, and then as a partnership, and we've talked a bit about this, James, um, we are also looking at how we invest in areas outside uh, retail. And that's important both because our customers say to us, we trust we trust you so much as a brand you know we'd love to see you be more active in things like financial services um outdoor living and housing so it's important for our customers but it's what, 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 sorry Sharon, financial services and what's the outdoor outdoor out, outdoor living and housing right and that, those are the areas that our customers would love us to be doing more in and it's also inc inc excuse me, incredibly important for us as a, as a partnership because you know to be frank retail margins are declining over time. And so for us, um, improving our profitability and having more diverse areas of profit is incredibly important for a partnership, which as you say, wants to pay well and, um, and wants to pay, wants, you know, wants to, wants to do good. So we're envisaging that by 2030, 40% of our profits will, will come from outside retail. But in the short term, you know, really making sure that our stores sing and soar, but also that some of the areas that our customers have said, actually, um, you know, we, we think you could do even better. We need you to be even better value for us. Mm. We really want you to double down on sustainability. All those things you will you will see over the coming months in, in both brands. And, what, and, and just on the, the, the second to that, the, 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 the second part of it, the kind of the new revenue streams, the new lines of business, what do you mean in housing? Is there a, is there a future world in which I will be able to buy a John Lewis house? Um, so we, the, the, in, the, in the short term, we're really focusing on financial services, as you'd expect, because we've, you know, we've, been in the, we've been in this for 15 years, but it's always been a very, very sort of tiny, tiny business. Um, so housing, we are, partly we're looking at our own property estate. Um, got to help, you know, we were already a landlord in some uh, parts of the country, and we're looking um, at whether we can take that further through um, private rental housing with some, uh, with some affordability mix. And clearly doing this with, with other partners, so whether that's in developers or, in, or investors. So it's definitely watch, watch this space, but I think it's a potentially very exciting area for us.
And, and how difficult is it, Sharon? Because I think, you know, as you said, you know, when they approached you, you weren't a retailer. And um, I think I said to you on the phone the other day, the, the funny thing about retailing is it's sort of grand strategy, understanding consumer psychology, and then some straight out and out street fighting as, you know, the retailers <laughs> you could add. How difficult is it coming into a sector that's new to you and then having to make, you know, what are colossal strategic calls with the you know future of those ten thousand partners at stake, but also with the heritage of a business that, you know, as you say, stands for something and is known for something, and then you're saying, look, we're going to make a big future bet on something that's not traditionally been our core business. How difficult is that to do internally? Um. So, I mean, it's definitely um. What I would say in the partnership is that there has been a real readiness and appetite to chart our future together. So if you're thinking about, you know, how, how partners have um, responded, um, it's been, so partners have been incredible, I mean, it has been extraordinary, have been incredibly both very welcoming uh, of me, but also very, very supportive of the plan. Partly, to be frank, we've done an awful lot of engagement with partners. So in putting together the priorities for the next few years, it's been very much a partnership engagement. 10,000 of our 80,000 partners to, to part, voted on ideas, voted on priorities, um, listening sessions, um, engagement. We have, a, have, we have our own sort of parliamentary council within the business that was very involved and very engaged. So this has not been somehow the sort of, you know, an outsider that's come in and, you know, you know, new to retail, this is the blueprint. I mean, I very much come in um, as somebody who uh, is really trying to double down on the purpose and the ambition of the partnership and the confidence that we have to succeed. And in doing so, I think helping, you know, helping us as a business really be clear about where those strategic pivots are and really having the confidence to act um, to act quickly. Now, you know, obviously I've done, you know, big leadership jobs uh, with a great deal of complexity and, and ambiguity. And, and of, although retail's new, um, actually there are, you know, there are very, very sort of close parallels with, um, you know, not least the, the degree to which, you know, John Lewis, is, John Lewis and Waitrose are the national treasure, very much as a public, public debate there's love and affection for the brands it's a very open very publicly um debated it's very you know the very very close parallels as I say with them um, you know some of the work I did at Ofcom and and, uh, and in government can I, Sharon can I bring can I bring in a few people who are asking questions about yeah, something? So, for example so you know you, you talk about sustainability and I wonder it must also be interesting having a sort of real, real focus on sustainability and then thinking, okay, what's your responsibility for consumerism, right? And mm -hmm. I see that I see that um, Louise Weiss has raised this question about the circular economy and how does John Lewis play a part in that? And Louise, if you're there, do you want to put this point to Sharon? Hello. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks. Um, so I work in a startup in the um, sustainable fashion industry, a peer-to-peer -peer reselling marketplace. And uh, there's a lot of startups in this space, but a lot of us are looking at the major retailers and wondering how much do they, are they seriously considering sort of secondhand resale yeah. culture and do they want to be part of it? Are they going to support it? I wondered if John Lewis have any plans in that direction or how you're thinking about resale. No, we definitely do. So we should be in. We should maybe Louise hook up um, afterwards. So as part of this, this, the, the new partnership plan, this new strategy we have, we are definitely being much more assertive in the circular economy. So in each of our categories, fashion, home, tech, we are looking at resale um, buyback options. We, it's, it's fascinating because we already do a lot in the brand and we, we don't really engage our customers very much on this. So you know, if you if you buy a sofa um, from John Lewis, you can um, get it re, re upholstered for fifty percent of the original uh, selling price. And there are lots. We've got lots of kind of examples, but we haven't really brought um, together into a into a sort of proposition uh, for customers that they can that they can really sort of get their teeth in and and really understand. 
we're doing a lot more you'll know possibly the sort of mother of pearl brands we're doing a lot more with sustainable um uh, fashion brands but the circular economy you will see us getting significantly more more into and you know so lots of the expertise we don't have ourselves are very keen to work with um, other brands and startups who are doing some really interesting things in this space thanks louise and, and thanks sharon that's really that, that's really interesting by the way i just want to point out that one person in the chat sharon as you were speaking was uh, was talking a little about uh the the role of john lewis as a landlord but not probably in the way you imagined she writes <laughs> that you used to go to one of your stores for the three hours that my daughter was at her nursery school and spent that time writing my ma i paid quote unquote rent with a three hour long cappuccino so i hope the business <laughs> model you develop is probably a little i, a little I hope it's several several cappuccino cappuccinos <laughs> Can I can I bring in um, Tracy Angel, who is um, w w was a was a former partner? She writes in the chat, and I don't know Tracy whether you're there because I think you're talking about. Yeah, hello Tracy. Why don't you put your point in the chat to, to Sharon? Um, Sharon, I did twenty years in the partnership, and if you'd have chopped my arm off, um, it absolutely bled green blood. Mm -hmm. um, and my name's a bit of a giveaway, so there's not that many angels in the partnership, and one of my offsprings is still there. Um, and I hear so often um, that all the change that's going on, and I get the partnership has been really slow to respond to change, hugely frustrating for partners that were forward thinking. Um, and it's always been really, really slow. And I absolutely understand that you have to, you know, you, you've been brought in to save this business and it deserves saving and it deserves a place in the high street. But I'm continually saddened that with all the change that is going on and I hear really clear your message that you're doing the right things and you do, you're doing what you're doing because you're an expert at what you're doing and why you're doing it. But the reality is, is that the the people it's being delivered to are not getting that that message and I almost feel like this isn't the platform because I don't want to be negative because you know I love this business um, and I'm not sure that the people that you are asking to filter down your message are doing you a good service when answers are well, we haven't thought about that. Real basics about, can you explain why this decision has been made? Well, no, not really, but it's been made. And it feels like it's not good enough when the partners were at the, have always been at the heart of the business. And actually how many of them are going to want to continue to work in a business where they're losing confidence that they're really being, you know, given the information that they're asking for when they're considering their futures. Yeah, no, Tracy, thanks so much for, for popping into the chat it's, and it's really helpful feedback. It's been, I mean, as you say, Tracy, that it's been a phenomenal um, amount of change over the last year and, um, you know, none of this, um, you know, I think difficult in, in any conventional business, I think particularly difficult um, in, 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 in the partnership, given, you know, all the importance that we place on, you know, great, great engagement and partners at the centre of, you know, of every decision we, we take. It's been, it's been tough, whether that's been, um, you know, as I say, some of the things we've done on stalls or, or, or headquarters. I think what's been, um, you know, when I think about this of last year and, um, and some of the sort of moments I most remember are some of the lessons I get from um, some, some of the partners who have, who have moved on from the business. And I've, Somebody, you know, we, one of the stores we closed, sadly, last um, summer in King's Cross. And I had a letter from a partner who said, you know, I've been, in, I've been in the business for 20 years and I love the partnership. And, um, you know, really I really understand and respect the decision. And I love this business so much that um, here, here, are, here are 10 pages explaining <laughs> um, what, what I think you should do next. And um, I, and you know, with some diagram. I mean, you'll you'll know it well, Tracy, because this is what you know, this is what's so fantastic um, about the partnership. And it does it does take time. It's a you know, I'm a new chairman. We've got a new team, um, but I am um, you know possibly more more confident uh, than you that um, um, if particularly if we if we continue to focus on the core values of why we're doing this. 
and the principles that ultimately this is about you know getting the business to a position where not only are we more commercially successful we can do more good um uh uh i, I think you know, I, I, I'm, I am i am confident about the future i mean i sorry i would love to be able to write to you if i thought my email would get to you it does i would it does and i respond to every I respond to every email I get from a current or former partner. Please do. Do you? I will do because my experience has been as I exited the business that actually everything was 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 filtered out, and and I would urge you to read the minutes. And I'm I don't know how you're going to have time, but to actually read the minutes that are going on in consultation and the lack of clarity going forward to the people that make, you know, those people on the ground that are doing that work, that the people above them don't seem to have the rationale as to why they've apportioned the change as to where they've apportioned it and many other things. So I will write to you and thank you for taking I'm, my question. I'm, no, I'm super easy to find. Yes. Either at John Lewis or waitrose.co.uk. And um, yeah, it'd be great to get into a bit of debate after the session. Thank you. Tracy, Tracy, thank you. Can I can I um Sharon, can can we learn a little bit more about this? Um I, I want to invite Kate Grigg in as well, just because I, I want to just understand how partnership works right and also because let, let me be a little bit more if you like skeptical for a second which is on the one hand a lot of people will admire and rather envy a working culture where there is partnership where the people who work for it have a stake in what the outcomes are and therefore if you like have a right to weigh in on the you know strategic decision making on the other hand there'll be people outside it who think themselves good grief you know, all the best of luck trying to trying to make a decision is difficult enough. Trying to make a decision in consultation with 10,000 mm -hmm. people is even harder. And trying to make a decision when those 10,000 people somehow think they have a right to a consensus is harder still. Right? So it's not culturally for free or even commercially for free having that partnership. And, and Kate Grigg, I don't know, Kate, if you're there, you, you've put this point about how do you embed space for partners to challenge the overall direction of partnership. I'm interested to hear that and then interested to hear, Sharon, how the thing actually works. Yeah. Is Kate, is Kate going to come on? Yes, she's just, yes. Hi there. Hi, yeah, morning, Sharon. Um, I'm just really interested off the back of Tracy's comments there, kind of going beyond this more traditional engagement and consultation, how there is space within the governance arrangements within John Lewis for partners to have you know, that stake in real strategic decision-making and, and the overall direction of the organization, as well as that space for challenge and, and holding to account um, and, and how these kind of structures are, are being embedded. And I suppose what the outcomes have been and, and how that's been viewed by partners um, in, in the sense of commitment and, and being able to have maybe greater influence um, in decision-making overall. Yeah, it's super helpful. And I might okay, just sort of link it to James's point about sort of how maybe how some of the how some of the structures work. Um, uh, so we, I always think about our sort of democracy or engagement at three three tiers. So we have a um, we have a partnership council, um, sixty five strong, which is voted on by um, partners, um, operate a three year term. And they, alongside myself as chairman and our board, form essentially a sort of a three-part kind of decision-making structure. And uh, Partnership Council's got many very important jobs. One is to hold uh, the chairman to account. And so I have a session with, a formal session with council twice a year and, it's, and, um, uh, and they vote. And there's a formal vote on whether the chairman continues in office so it's a, you know, it's a it's a very formal very important very very serious process and if you know if you lose um the support and credibility of council then the, the chairman does not have the you know there's then a, a process with our trustees and ultimately the, the the chairman can be can be exited i would also say there's then for me a sort of middle tier for our democracy which is which is for our partners who know our customers best how they influence and sway um, some of our, you know, 
commercial decisions. So James talked a bit earlier about, you know, how, how do we make sure that our department stores are, you know, fantastic places that, um, you know, customers want to shop in. Actually having more say from our customer faces partners who work in working branch, you'll know, you know, the particular products and services. So trying to sort of, uh, what I would say, sort of integrate and bring together some of the decisions that we might make on buying or trading actually with, with our customer facing partners. And then as you'll, um, certainly Tracy will know, you may know Kate, we also have um, uh, uh, sort of engagement in quite a structured way locally. So that might be in a branch uh, or a distribution center or part of head, head office. So partners have got the opportunity to, um, within, a, within a forum uh, as they're called to air their views and that could be anything from um you know are, are the fridges you know operating properly in the waitrose store right the way through to you know do we have the right plan um for the business and is the is the is the business going in the right direction so there were there were there were a lot of channels um i think like any um business any organization i think some of the channels work better in some places and at some points of time um, than others. Um, I certainly feel the engagement and discussions that we had with, uh, if I think particularly of council and partners on, on our new plan, um, to James's point, actually got a really good balance between moving at speed and pace, but also trying to ensure we've got, you know, as, as wide a buy-in and partners feeling that this isn't their plan and not something that's been imp imposed on them. But you know, it's a, it's a continual discussion and conversation. Thank you, Kate, and and, and thanks, Sharon. Sharon, I just wanted, uh, there are a couple of questions I want to talk about things beyond John Lewis, but I just wanted to finish up, if you like, with the sort of the fundamental question. I, I spoke to Simon Wolfson at Next a few weeks back, and his point was that people think that online is about um, convenience or even about cost. He says the real point about online is choice that, you know, if you're a retailer like Next, um, you know, you if you want to put in, let's say, one shirt into a shop and it needs to be in five sizes and you've got, you know, 400 shops, before you know it, you've got to buy, you know, 2,000 shirts, right? Whereas if you're buying it for online, you can buy just five shirts and therefore you can have a much, much wider range. And the, the, the threat of choice to bricks and mortar retailing is the thing that's probably most underestimated. And that is when you begin to understand that, you begin to see that ultimately uh, it's not just convenience, it's not just cost, but with choice as well, the forces of online are almost unstoppable. And I wonder whether you take that view, whether or not you think that something so fundamental is going to change, that our high streets are going to change, and bricks and mortar shopping is going to become, if you like, like horse riding. It's, it's just, it's a hobby, but it's not, it's not the way in which we get around. I have, um, I mean, I respect Simon massively. I have a slightly different view on online. It's not that you know, it's not that we don't all want choice. It's there is also the. Um, there's some ignominy in choice, which is we also want editing. Mm. So, I mean, I think about, you know, when I shop with Amazon, if I know the colour moleskin book I want, it's super easy, or the, you know, my kids lost yet another textbook from school. It's really, it's really easy to find, buy, and get it delivered either later that day or the next day. If I don't know whether I'm going to spend, you know, four hundred pounds on a, you know, if I spend five hundred pounds on the washing machine versus four hundred, is it worth it? Is that difference worth it? Mm -hmm. And I think certainly where the partnership comes in, both in terms of um, our wonderful partners in store, but as we're trying to replicate some of that service online, I think a lot of it is around editing and and trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so our customers will trust us to say, well, actually, you know, you can save a hundred pounds because it's still fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And so I think, you know, I think it's really interesting because obviously a number, I think Memonessa are also doing a very similar thing, which is sort of, you know, it's widening access to brands mm -hmm. on the same side. And I, you know, I think, and Simon's done it, and it's, it's been extremely successful for, for Next. I don't think that that's where, um, you know, JLP's, great comparative advantages you come to us because you trust us you've got great yeah. independent 
impartial advice. I know when I look online, the first 10 choices aren't sponsored by the company that's trying to sell me stuff. I know it's because it comes from what I believe is going to be the right, um, the right, the right option, the best value option for the customer. Okay, well, so for someone who flails around, I have to say, in online shopping, that really, really personally, really <laughs> I'm just going to come to Daniel Habib because Daniel's made had his hands up and has made a few points about John Lewis. Daniel, are you there? Hi there. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, um, I've got a few questions. Um, uh, I could talk Daniel, about. Just, Daniel, will you just ask one question? Forgive me for interrupting. <laughs> okay, just, I'm okay. aware of time, and I want to which, ask a little bit about. Off which question would you prefer me to talk about the sustainability? Um, how it's work? How it's like working in the partnership during the pandemic, or the future of the partnership? I am. Um, I've got a, a very long list of questions, but you can you can choose uh, which one would be best to talk about first, if you'd like. Well, Daniel, you cho you far away. Choose the one that you think is most important. Uh, and Daniel, uh, so waitress are you? I'm a waitress, Windsor. Windsor, okay. Okay. Um, currently, um, uh, I, well, just one thing: uh, the report into the women's uh, in the uh, wait, uh, John Lewis partnership supply chain of 2012, which was on the uh, Waitrose website. It's currently not available and you're not allowed to look at the report. It's telling me to sign on to PartnerLink at the moment. And it's kind of, once you start to do PartnerLink, it's completely dead. Um, I, like, I would like to look further into uh, how the company is trying to um, increase on women's issues, for example, in um, with International Women's Day being yesterday and uh, how, um, it's dealing with situations like that in the partnership as a whole. Daniel, thank you. Sharon. Um, it's a great question. So hopefully, Daniel, you've, hopefully you've picked up from some of the discussions we've had recently. So diversity and inclusion is a um, huge issue for us. You'll know that on gender, obviously we're, we're majority female, but we're majority female, mostly part-time and mostly in, um, in less senior roles and the supply chain, again, you'll know is, is, uh, is particularly underrepresented in terms of gender and particularly underrepresented in terms of gender at senior levels. So we are um, in the throes of a new diversity and inclusion strategy and, and keen that we are, you know, really much more open to, to all the talents. There's work to do, not just on gender, um, ethnicity, particularly at senior levels where um, representation gets, very, very significantly uh, less the more senior you are in, in the business. So I think there's lots and lots of opportunity for us, uh, Daniel, and um, it would be great to great to get your thoughts again off, offline if you want to get in touch. Sharon, thank you. And Daniel, thank you. Sorry to cut off. I imagine that you have a, 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 good, a good number of questions. Well, I wanted to just touch on one final thing before we're done, Sharon, if you don't mind, which is I want to go back to your to your past life and to Ofcom. And 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 obviously, you know, as you said, you know, there's a good deal about understanding digital marketplaces that I'm sure has been enormously helpful in this job. But but I'm struck by the fact that, you know, in 2021, we've already seen in the United States, this huge challenge to the way in which democracy works, what we saw on January the 6th, and the extent to which, you know, online marketplaces for information and debate seem to have become so polarized and dangerous. We've seen really the kind of meaningful launch of the Facebook oversight board, a kind of act of self-regulation that some people think is a step in the right direction, others say is not enough. And I wondered when you look back on your time at Ofcom and you look back overall at the oversight and the regulation of online, how worried you are about the battle for truth and how worried you are by the extent to which these big tech platforms have power that we can't seem to regulate or, or make accountable? Oh, that's a great question and a big question. Um, uh, you know, I, I have to say, I have, I have, so I think it's, it's a, I mean, the straight answer to your question is, I think it's a huge, huge issue with, you know, the tech platforms clearly significantly bigger and than individual countries. I think, you know, what we saw also recently happening with Facebook in, in Australia. I mean, I have to say, I, I veered personally as to, um, as to the role of a regulator in this space. 
and um you know if i was still at ofcom you know the, you know the organization there is sort of ready in um to uh to um to regulate um for the uk these international companies and regulation that isn't necessarily going to be you know absolutely aligned to what other countries are doing i think it's incredibly difficult when you look at um you know donald trump um being taken off you know twitter and other social platforms is that a is that a triumph of um democracy uh triumph for um ethics or is that anti-freedom of, of speech and anti-freedom of expression and i think um I think a regulator essentially to take on the views of a society in making judgments um, about what should and shouldn't be demonstrably shown to the public beyond those things which you know are already deemed to be illegal and for which there's already legislation, whether that's you know hate speech or incitement to hate and so on. I think it's a really difficult area, James. And I've you know, having got myself before I left off from sort of, you know, comfortable with a regulatory framework which basically focuses on, you know, transparency, um, I'm probably more um, sceptical, cautious about the ability of regulators really to get a grip with it. It's not the, it's not the quality and capability of regulators. I think it's almost an impossible job you're giving them. And is it, that, that, that's really interesting, Sharon. So it's, it's, is that because you think that it's not the job of the regulator to try and set the rules and the framework, i.e. legislators have to do that and then regulators can implement? Or is it because you think that even legislators can't really grapple with something that's that large, that fast, that global? I think it's probably more than less. I mean, we, I mean, the leg, you know, we've got really clear legislation that, you know, incitement to, you know, racist acts, hate, hate, um, field acts, etc. That's that's illegal. That's already illegal. And whether you perpetrate that in person or whether you perpetrate that online, that is already covered by um, criminal legislation. And it's still incredibly difficult for um, the authorities because of the speed and the volume and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, to, um, to 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 capture that and to deal with it. Um, and I think what's the very, very difficult grey area for regulators is that they're being asked not just to worry about the things which are already illegal, yes, but to worry about those things that you know a particular society might find troublesome and worrying that that isn't captured. You know, the Parliament hasn't deemed to be a criminal criminal act. Yeah, um, and. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. a, that's a pretty uncomfortable space to be in. And, and the difficulty, of course, is troublesome and worrying at in, at enormous scale can be more than just troublesome and worrying, but not yes, necessarily in the individual yeah. case. Um, Sharon, uh, I see that we've run out of time. I do have to ask you one thing, because we're now past the hour in which I promised <laughs> we weren't going to talk about Harry and Meghan. Did you watch it? I did. <laughs> what did you think? Um... I mean, I remember, I just thought it was all quite sad, is what I thought. We, um, it was quite sad. Were you, were you shocked by the conversation about the, the colour of uh, their son's skin? I mean, I'm, you know, you know not, I'm obviously I'm not going to, you know, who quite knows what the circumstances are. I think it's, um, I think it's like any any difficult family issues you sort of, that you're that are playing out live. I just think it's, it's, it's just it's just quite it's just quite uncomfortable so I watched it my husband didn't watch it but I watched it with my older son and uh... did you yeah I I have to say it's um uh yeah I think sad is right isn't it it's very actually strange at the end of it it is really upsetting um and um it'll be amazing to see how many uh how many people watched it um anyway listen i i promised that we wouldn't veer into it and then even in the last minute i couldn't quite help myself <laughs> I, uh, apologies, apologies, Sharon. but but um so i just wanted to say thank you because um you know what you've done for us this morning is exactly what we'd most hoped which is to actually get the chance to sit and really hear and understand the way in which your experience informed the way you think about the UK about issues like universal basic income, but about 
the really big strategic choices and then the practical uh, requirements of implementing those in a in a business that we all really care about in John Lewis. Um, and so Sharon, I just wanted to say thank you for your time because I know everyone has had spent more than enough time on these screens. Um, we can't give you a round of applause. We can't even give you a, you know, a sort of sandwich to say thank you very much and have a nice day. But uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, we will give you a happy wave off and wish you a very good day. Great. Thanks so much to everybody for joining, James. Lovely to see you. Thanks Bye. So much. Bye.